Hello, welcome to this new episode of Hessian Scrum. Joining us today is RG from the band Zeta, who recently released their debut album, Devouring Darkness. Hello, RG. How are you today? I'm doing very well. Thank you for having me, Nick. Appreciate it. Yeah. So, you know, you recently released your album, Devouring Darkness. And, um, you know, nowadays, you know, where we get a lot of copycat bands, this quite stood out, you know, very different. You know, there's a lot of stuff going on. You have 10 million different influences. Um, you know, what? before we start, let's get into the album. So, you know, what were you going for musically? Well, when I started recording, it was uh, pretty much the first that I had ever worked with recording software or writing songs or anything. I played guitar for a long time on and off. And uh, I found out that my iPad had GarageBand. So I started doing some stuff and then it couldn't really handle all of the uh, stuff that I wanted to. So I actually got real you know, equipment and software and went from there. And a lot of the stuff that I was trying to kind of capture I think at the time I was really into Mortuary Drape, which is one of my kind of favorite black metal bands. Um, but I'm also just a huge, you know, kind of old school death metal person. And I kind of grew up learning thrash. And so all of those influences kind of really worked their way into the album. And so I tried to blend enough of the black and the death together to just make it something that people weren't really hearing, or at least I wasn't hearing with a, a lot of stuff out there because I, I truly dig the big fat riffs of bands like, you know, Bolt Thrower, Carcass, stuff like that, along with uh, a lot of the other kind of tremolo picking and unique progressions and stuff with a, a lot of black metal bands. Yeah, you know, um, there is definitely a very strong old, old school influence. You know, you can, I can definitely tell that your influence is light mainly in the 90s but then there's you know you have some of those kind of arpeggios or more reminiscent kind of like the death spell omega inspired bands interesting i don't know if i've ever listened to death spell omega uh if i have it was in passing and didn't really uh kind of pay that much attention to them but that's interesting to hear you know it was um especially on um um the first song of the album after the kind of, you know, after the thing, the first chorus, you have that kind of, uh, no, it's during that, the, the chorus, you know, um, you have that kind of passage, like very arpeggiated, very modern black metal-ish, if you know what I mean. Oh, okay. Hey, that's, that's cool to know. You know, I love when people tell me, oh, you know, this reminds me of uh, this band or this band, because I keep asking people and they're, you know, they give me a whole bunch of different, uh, you know, stuff, bands that honestly I've never heard of or really listen to because now now i've got the exact part it's um you know when um t t sings are you know locked inside the cage specimens on display yeah that that part has a kind of very slow arpeggiated uh, maybe inquisition-esque kind of uh feel to it that would probably be a big uh, a big part of it there i'm a huge inquisition fan and i borrowed a lot of ideas from those guys because dagon's guitar uh, stuff is very unique and it's like something you just don't hear in mostly in any other bands so that was like a big influence on me uh, trying to get a lot of uh, stuff that they do because it's kind of arpeggiated and then he'll put a lot of kind of bends and stuff in places where it sounds just you know kind of weird and awkward and I was like that's that's what I want you know something that's not going to sound like everything else sounds and so uh, I would definitely say Inquisition was a huge influence on uh part of the the riffing style yeah and you know you have quite a few leads you know you have some sp space because you know the whole theme is space but you know that's another question how do you make a space album without it sounding um you know sci-fi without sounding for lack of a better term you know cringe where it's you know a lot of bands you can tell oh our entire gimmick is science fiction tropes well that's a great question uh Probably number one is because, as I mentioned, it was my first attempt at recording and I had no idea what I was doing. And so I think that may have played into my favor because I didn't rely on, you know, a lot of, I guess, techniques or, as you mentioned, tropes that other people have used before. I literally had no idea what I was doing. And it just like, 
I was trying to capture what I was hearing in my head. And so that's just kind of how things, you know, they just fell out like that when I was uh, recording. And I was like, man, that sounds cool. So I just kept a lot of stuff and uh, it, it ended up on the record. And so um, I used for all the kind of atmospheric bits and pieces, um, I used a little Korg uh, Volca. I'm not sure if you're familiar with that. It's a, let me grab it. It's like this tiny little uh, analog synth. That's really cool. Uh, I have no idea how to like use it. So I just twisted knobs and would record stuff that sounded good and I would just layer them together. And then I used this, um, it's like a package of, of like software sounds for people making, I guess, video games or movies or stuff like that. And they had a whole bunch of like sound effects. And so I, I took the ones that were kind of space or spaceship sounding and put them in there and tried to keep it a bit more, uh, I guess, kind of like older, a bit closer to the kind of original Trek series and the next generation, because a lot, uh, like you mentioned, a lot of um, bands that use sci-fi themes are, you know, very futuristic and, and stuff like that. And I wanted it to be a bit more, uh, I guess, kind of campy and have a bit more of that kind of 60s, 70s vibe to it, because that's the, some of the, the sci-fi stuff that I kind of like is, you know, it's not in HD, it's not all these gigantic uh, cinematic, you know, explosions and stuff. And they just used whatever type of um, things that they could. And, you know, we look at it now and it looks kind of cheap and, you know, whatever. But to me, I freaking love it. Yeah, definitely. You know, I do. I, I do agree with you that CGI and over, like, you know, over the top effects just makes things everything so uh, samey. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And, and that's like kind of a, a big thing that I wanted to stay away from because uh, there's just so much of just people doing all the same stuff, you know, if it's copying, you know, the same, you know, guitar uh, settings, to, you know, or recording techniques to, you know, sound, you know, like, you know, modern death metal or whatever, you know, all those kind of get lumped together and, and it gets a little bit kind of boring to me. So uh, I think my lack of knowledge and expertise and just, you know, hitting record and just going with whatever that came out was uh, an advantage and just that kind of free flowing capturing you know what was in the moment and just being happy with that instead of trying to overthink stuff and trying to do what other people were doing was very beneficial to the way that the songs and the album came out yeah you know one thing that really stands out is you use you have a lot of kind of a little leads going on throughout which really kind of unique were you maybe inspired by Trey Azek thought you know the one that comes to mind is on the the course of Adra Great Deceiver Oh, absolutely. He is um, probably one of my favorites just because he sounds like an alien trying to play guitar and it's just otherworldly. And uh, aside from my kind of classical hard rock metal influences of, you know, Michael Schenker, all of that kind of 70s stuff, uh, UFO, um, Scorpions, and then uh, Andy LaRoque from King Diamond is another one of my absolute favorites. Uh, I love their style, but Trey is just doing something. I don't know. And he's just has all of these weird, you know, whammy bar kind of dives and just squeals and wails. And just, it sounds very haunting and just otherworldly. So I tried to like capture a lot of, a lot of that stuff in there, you know, uh, but not to, you know, overdo it and overuse it was kind of the, I had to hold myself back from like, oh, I could, you know, just put them every, 20 seconds uh that was kind of a challenge but definitely trey was a, a big influence on that all right so, so you know when you said scorpions and you know michael schenker and andy LaRock, you know thinking about the kind of songs like sales of sharon and all that stuff uh you know assault attack by michael schenker really um, you know because that was very influential to kind of like the older death metal stuff and everything but it's kind of gone like is that something that, you know, you really wanted to bring into your stuff? Because you don't really hear it, you know, but maybe it comes out subconsciously one way or another. Yeah, that's a, uh, another great question. I am a huge fan of, you know, a lot of the kind of hard rock 
from the 70s, early 80s, glam stuff. I love, you know, I could listen to, um, you know, bands like, you know, Kiss or Rat or Dawkin. I listen to that almost as much as I do, you know, any black metal or death metal and stuff. And so uh, I kind of wanted to somehow sneak some of those things in there. And I don't know if I got it in, but it, I guess some of it did which is really cool because I think it would be a really cool marriage if you could do, you know, uh, hard rock glam with black metal. That would just be killer to me because it would sound so unique and crazy. And I just love, you know, the, uh, the, the writing style of, you know, guys like Michael Schenker uh, from the seventies and the way that, you know, their songs flowed and they just weren't, uh, repetitive, you know, first chorus, first chorus, you know, type of songs. A lot of them were just, they just kind of flow with the moment and change directions. And, and uh, I really love that. Yeah, definitely. I mean, you know, Michael Chicken, even when he had those kind of verse chorus songs, it just sounded great either way, you know, with UFO, uh, Rock Bottom, Doctor Doctor. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. I was actually just listening to that uh, Strangers in the Night um, a few days ago on uh, my stereo and I was like man like this it, that's my favorite live album ever and I will fight anyone on that because it just sounds so great and they are super tight and his solos are just amazing so uh, if people haven't checked out Strangers in the Night killer album oh yeah d definitely I mean and you know it's like um, sometimes the thing I hate about Michael Schenker is he only does the extended solos on like the live recordings or live, you know, when he, uh, you know, he takes a 30 second solo, makes it out to three, four minutes, never boring, never, it's never gratuitous, you know, it's just great stuff. Yeah, his playing always reminds me of like a cat that's falling down the stairs and lands on his feet every single time <laughs> because he's so unique and a lot of the little twists and turns that he do are kind of subtle yet unexpected all the time. And then he just, you know, always ends right where it needs to be and, you know, he doesn't have all the, you know, whammy bar stuff. He just makes it work with, you know, his, his, uh, his technique. And I just always found that so unique uh, about him. Yeah, I remember this great interview where he once said, you know, he refused to do anything related to tapping or anything that he saw Van Halen do. Like, he's like, great guitarist, but I'm not copying him. <laughs> yeah. Oh, totally. Yeah. Yeah, I've, I've noticed that too. He doesn't use a lot of uh, techniques like that. I don't see him doing a lot of sweet picking. And, and stuff like that. I can't sweep pick to save my life. And so my kind of like soloing skills are, uh, I don't have all those, you know, uh, all those things in my arsenal, like a lot of guitars have. So uh, I can, you know, do tapping. It's probably where all the harmonics and the, the squeals and stuff come from. Those are, that's what I got to work with, with my level, level of talent. And uh, I think they suit the music. Um, because like we mentioned before, you know, one of the tropes of all the um, kind of modern sci-fi sounding albums is, you know, just the sweet picking and all of the technicality and stuff. And uh, I don't have that. <laughs> I just have some whatever, whatever comes out, comes out. And I don't really think about it. I just try to like, oh, can I play that again? And just work on it until I get it to, you know, kind of land where it needs to land. So, you know, on this album, you worked with, um, you know, two guest musicians right yes yeah so um can you tell us about how they contributed they add stuff to the songs or did you write the songs and then they just kind of um you know worked their way in and played what you had written out uh it's more of the, the uh latter i had the songs and the lyrics and all of that kind of done and then i asked them to uh you know do the vocals and the drums and um Thomas, the vocalist, he added quite a bit of stuff to it that was unexpected. And I'm like, oh, well, that's cool. You know, he layered um, the vocals. So he did two uh, lead vocals that he kind of like copied, you know, each uh, side left and right. And then he did two more vocals for the backing uh, the backing vocals, which are more the kind of death metal growls and stuff. So he did four tracks for every 
song and the way it came out when they were put together it just blew my mind I wasn't thinking uh, of doing that and yeah that just made it so unique to me I was like oh wow like keep doing that uh as for David on drums um bless his heart because I am not the best at tempo <laughs> as I said you know this is my first time to record and figure stuff out I had no idea what I was doing uh he had to go through stuff and I had to re-record things and and fix uh, quite a few pieces, but all of the drumming stuff that he did was his own kind of unique contributions. I had started recording with uh, Easy Drummer just to get some stuff in there. And when I first started on the project, I didn't even think of having a real drummer. Uh, but as the project kind of moved forward and started sounding better, I was like, this is something that I probably deserves to have someone do better than my little cutting and pasting different pieces of drums since I know absolutely nothing about drums. Uh, and I asked him to do it and he just went off and did some crazy stuff. He is such an amazing drummer. He can play literally anything, any style, any tempo, any rhythmic things. He came up with ideas that were well beyond anything I would have ever imagined for the album. Um, he, he played some stuff that was so uh, you know, technical and amazing that I had to tell him to tone it down. I'm like, dude, my guitar playing and songs are not good enough to have that drumming on it. So he simplified it and it was still above and beyond anything I could uh, hope for. So he just did his own stuff with it and he kind of felt out the songs. And uh, there were a couple, maybe one or two pieces of each song that you know i may have said hey let's try something else here and then that was pretty much it he nailed everything like spot on such an amazing guy and just nice super nice willing to kind of work with you know other people people's idea and and uh, thomas was the same way so being able to have both of those people who are not you know ego maniacs because i'm not one either i'm very open to collaborate and whatever i you know kind of put down doesn't have to be the final word if someone else has something uh to contribute to make it better then man my ears are open uh because i'm all about that so having both of those gentlemen work with me you know with the songs and stuff was just an, an amazing experience and i'm so fortunate to have uh both of them yeah they all did a great job and then you know uh, after that you know you have a fantastic piece of uh, artwork you know which i absolutely love you know uh, could you tell us more about that? Absolutely. Um, so the piece that I was able to use is from the legendary sci-fi fantasy artist, Bruce Pennington, the UK. Uh, and it is the book cover from Eschatus, which is his, I can't remember the year. I think it's like 78, 79 when it came out. I could be wrong. Um, but it's a, a book of Nostradamus's prophecies that he put to illustration and so the uh, piece that I used uh, you know reminded me of the Antichrist coming uh, you know back down to earth or whatever the four horsemen of the apocalypse are in the kind of background and stuff and as soon as I kind of saw that it immediately resonated with me and I knew that I just had to have it because it fits most with the song Ardra, which is about um, a kind of false antichrist, uh, whatever figure, false devil that comes to another planet and does the same thing of, you know, everyone sold their soul to them. And now, you know, a thousand years later, uh the, the antichrist or the devil is back to claim uh his or her uh in the episode it's a, a female that comes back to kind of claim their uh the planet for themselves and stuff so as soon as i saw that i was like man that is that has got to be the album cover and i hunted it down because i wasn't familiar with it at all and i just went to his website and um you know he had a, a little paragraph in there. Hey, if anybody wants to use the work, just please contact me, let me know and typed out an email and his 
I guess, assistant or curator of his uh, work. His name's Nigel Suckling. Um, sent me uh, some correspondence and, you know, he went and asked if we could use it. And he said, you know, yes, just give him uh, credit for it and send him a few copies uh, if we ever get anything printed and made. And so I was like, heck yeah. So we uh, were able to use it. He sent me the, the best kind of photo that he had of it. And I sent that to my label. And um, Josh did a great job with kind of leaving it intact the way it was and not manipulating it to look more modern and more, you know, whatever. It's pretty much, you know, as is. And it's a very big piece. So you get to see a lot of the illustration in it. And uh, it just captures so much of the imagination. And, you know, I could stare at it all the time. It's the screensaver on my computer. And I, my screen's kind of big, so I can just see all the brush strokes on it and just all these little fine details. And it's just a, um, it's just a painting that you see more and more every time that you look at it. And I just find that uh, just incredible. So I'm very fortunate to be able to use it and very thankful to Mr. Pennington and to Mr. Suckling for uh, allowing me to do so and for their time and effort to, to make that happen. And uh, I did send them um, two copies of the vinyl and two CDs uh, a few weeks ago. Not sure if they're gonna be fans of the music, you know, considering their age, but <laughs> I'm sure they appreciate the sentiment. Oh, oh definitely. And uh, there's a lot of other uh, metal bands too that use their work, um, Blood Incantation, has used his artwork for two of their albums, which is pretty interesting. Yeah, and, and they, ha they had, there was that kind of like fake controversy where um, another band had used the exact same artwork and they people were accusing Blood Incantation of stealing their artwork, but both were licensed by the, by the same guy, so. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, and there was uh, just another band recently, um, from the U.S. or I think Australia or the U.S. I can't remember. Uh, someone on Instagram reached out to me and said, "Hey, uh, these guys just used the same artwork that you did for their album." And I was like, "Oh, okay." And I, when I was in correspondence with uh, Nigel, you know, he was like, mm, "They didn't really ask to use that." And so, you know, he just said, "We're going to let karma, you know, of the universe, you know, sort itself out." And so. Uh, it's a great uh, piece of art, so I could definitely see why they would want to use it. But, uh, you know, it would have been polite to just, uh, you know, ask or to do a quick Google search and, you know, see that the art had already been used just a, a few months ago. So, yeah, you, you know, I've seen that so many times. Like, you see a lot more of like public domain art when you have like six or seven raw black metal projects on YouTube with the exact same piece, you know. Yeah, it's pretty crazy. Uh, yeah, again, you know, 10 second Google search, you can kind of see what's already been done before and then hopefully be a little bit more, you know, uh, find something a bit more unique, you know, or, I mean, there's a ton of artists out there that would love some work, you know. Oh, yeah, definitely. But then, you know, it's, I can understand when you're broke, young, and you have the worst recording equipment ever, and you need yeah. those five remaining dollars to buy a cable, does it, that it, the, like literally sticks in the guitar jack you know i can understand that as well yeah yeah it's tough and you know <laughs> hey you know hopefully they'll you know get better gear make better music and you know eventually get some uh unique artwork to to fit that you know i'd love you know everybody to be successful yeah. with it so you know it's all a, a i guess progression and for me i got unbelievably lucky to i feel to be able to use that artwork and then again to have you know, Thomas and David uh, to be on the album and then to get on Spirit Coffin and have a person like Josh who worked super hard to make all of it happen. And never in my, you know, kind of wildest dreams, whenever I started recording, did I think it would go this far. It was always like, oh, wow, you know, what if we, uh, you know, get signed and, you know, it comes out on vinyl and I get on No Clean Singing. And those are all like, I had a list of like goals that I wanted for the album when I was just first starting out and they were like, you know, pipe dreams, but uh, I, I don't know how they all, you know, most of them came to fruition and it's just amazing. And I'm just very happy. 
Yeah, um, you know, so you know, you're signed with uh, Spirit Coffin, you know, which is uh, the label started by you know uh, Josh from Grizzly Bud. So how did that get together? And um, you know, how, how did that happen? Because with you know, with Josh, out of any other, did you have other labels in mind, or did he contact you? Or um, Thomas was very instrumental in saying, uh, "Yeah, we need to put this out," and he went hunting for labels and uh, stalked you know, death metal Facebook groups and all kind of stuff and just searched around. And uh, we had another label interested, I believe from Italy, they were a new label also. And they only wanted to just put out the music digitally, like on Bandcamp and other <laughs> streaming services. And they didn't want to do any physical stuff. Uh, so we're like, okay, cool. And we thought about it and decided, you know, let's try a little bit more and see what we can do. And then like a week or so later, you know, he said, hey, Josh said, hey, you know, check this out. You're not going to believe this. And uh, started emailing Josh from Spear Coffin. And, you know, everything was just pretty much straightforward and simple. And uh, I just couldn't believe that, uh, you know, we were going to be on a label that wanted to put out vinyl, wanted to, you know, promote it and have, you know, real PR and, and send it out there. And I was like, heck yeah, let's do it. Yeah, because you know, I uh, you know, I, I know the you know the guy from Journey into Darkness spoken quite a bit, you know, and I've seen what Josh does for you guys. It's it's impressive, you know, one man army who writes a, a million reviews a day and managed to get your stuff out on CD, cassette, and vinyl. <laughs> yeah, it's uh, impressive, and he is so busy. Uh, you know, like I mentioned before, I don't if he sleeps, I don't know how he does all of this stuff because he's continuously posting things, uh, and then he also has. Um, his own publication that he put out, I think it was Mystification, which is a metal zine that has a ton of interviews with a lot of, you know, kind of underground bands and really cool photos and just the design element of it. It's fantastic. The printing is top notch. And that's one thing I have got to say about Josh and Spirit Coffin is all of the products that they put out are not cheap. They're always well done. They look professional and they, they're they just really nice. You know, nothing about our album, um, you know, was cheap. The way it came out, it was on kind of heavier uh, stock for the sleeve. The liner for my album was a black poly lined bag, which is if you're a vinyl collector like me, that means I don't have to take the paper, cheap paper one and throw it away and then use one of my other better ones to put it in so having that was just a nice little touch of class and quality and everything that you know i've got from him is you know the same way so it's a high quality product it's not just some cheap stuff that people are pumping out to sell you know it's, it's a, a really high quality item so super impressed very proud uh to have that yeah, um you know also uh if you don't mind me saying this uh, you know i'm friends with the cave dweller music guys and, you know, I saw your name, you know, pop up on a certain list. Could you tell us something about that? In regards to a charity sampler. Oh, um, yeah, I believe they had done a review, maybe a little bit before Hessian Firm, or maybe it was after. Yeah, and then, just after. Uh, and then uh, I believe a few, a week or two later, they said, hey, uh, we're doing this kind of um, charity release, I believe sometime in May or something. And, you know, if you'd like to contribute a track to it, that'd be awesome. And I was, you know, beyond belief because uh, Brett had already said he would uh, add one of his to the list. And so I was like, heck yeah. So I, I checked with Josh at Spirit Coffin just to make sure that was cool. And he said, go for it. And uh, yeah, super excited to be on there. And uh, I'm not sure when it comes out, but I believe it's Lights of, Zata of Zatar is the track that uh, we're going to use. Yeah. Yeah. You know, because <laughs> I saw the list, you know, I, I won't I won't say more because, you know, the James is probably going to kill me for talking about it already. So. <laughs> All right. So, you know, now you have the great first album, you know, you didn't mess around with an EP or anything. Are you going to go straight to an album, another album? You know, how is this going to work out? For, you know, what's the future of Z Zeta? 
Um, uh, another great question. So Josh uh, said that he was uh, definitely interested in working together with me again with putting out another album. So uh, he had mentioned doing an EP next which I'm totally fine with. And I'm working on uh, music right now. So I have one song that has pretty much all the guitar parts. Uh, I just got some new bass strings so that I can redo the kind of bass track that I recorded. And um, I've got pretty much most of the lyrics figured out. So I'll be kind of rehashing them a little bit. Um, and then when I'm satisfied with that, you know, I'll start doing another song and uh, a few more. So once I'm done with all my stuff, generally that's when I send it to Thomas to get the uh, the vocal stuff we'll work through. And then last would be, you know, David's uh, drum part. So I'm hoping that we can have an EP out by, you know, January, February. Uh, and stuff. So I'll have a, a bit of time off this summer to kind of focus on that and work uh, and get into the rhythm of, you know, working on music uh, regularly. The past couple months have been um, challenging. There's a lot that have happened in my life. Some of it has been extremely positive and some of it uh, has been challenging. So I haven't really focused on my music as much as I would like to. But I definitely have the itch, again, to create and record. And I'm actually helping one of my uh, best friends from way back in high school. He, uh, he and I played um, together. He's kind of like one of my first like, guitar teachers. Um, he's been writing music for years. And he's decided, hey, he wants, he wants to uh, put some songs together. So he's been coming down. Um, and recording his stuff on my in my little uh, studio here, so uh, I'm kind of spending time, you know, with him uh, doing that, and you know, getting better at, you know, kind of uh, relearning the software because I haven't recorded since uh, the album really, and uh, I'm definitely excited to be a part of that uh, project as well. So. So musically for the new uh, EP that you're, that you're, do, you're working on right now, you know, what are you, where are you going? You know, what's the kind of general idea for it? Um, to, I wouldn't say move too far away from the direction where I went with the debut album, because I was really happy with it. Um, but I would like to try to incorporate a bit more synth parts i'm a huge fan of you know having synth and uh some keyboard stuff in music a lot of effects and a lot of extras you know uh because it's just fun to kind of play with those elements and just see what they can add to it i know a lot of people are are strict you know especially in black metal it's just you know guitar there might be a bass possibly plugged in who knows? And then, you know, drums, you know, beating on a trash can or something, but I just want to have fun with it and throw whatever I can out there and just make the music, you know, kind of loud and not loud, but uh, encompassing and somewhat three-dimensional. And that's why I love all of the, uh, you know, effects and stuff that I can add to it. And the synth uh, does that extremely well when you kind of uh, you can record tracks in stereo and pan things, you know, left to right. And I just love having that kind of three-dimensional sound uh, to an album. And uh, the one person we haven't talked about is uh, Nico Mix, who mixed and mastered the album and has been with me way before I ever talked to anybody else to work on the album. So he has been kind of my oldest uh, compatriot in actually making this uh, uh, first album happened. Yeah, because you know, um, on Metal Archives, you know, there is no mention. There is just uh, Blue Zone Corp <laughs> sampled sound effects. Yeah, and those are. Uh, I was looking, you know, for you know that kind of synth sound, and you know, I have no idea what I'm doing with my little synth. 
And so uh, I needed a bit more. And Blue Zone is a company that makes sounds and sound effects for, I guess, video games that people use or movies or documentaries or whatever. And so they had a kind of sci-fi pack to download for free. And I got on that and just dug through there and found the sounds I wanted and kind of layered them together and bits and pieces and faded them in and out. And now uh, <laughs> that was what I did. And then I tried to use my, uh, the core of the Volca, the little, the little synth I would add to some pieces of that. So for the new album, um, I definitely would uh, love to incorporate a lot more of that. And I might uh, look and see if someone else can help me um, do that better than I can. I just recorded some sounds and they happened to turn out good, but I know other people could probably do that a lot better than me. So uh, I'll kind of hunt around and, and see what I can come up with. But um, that's one of the things that I really would like to do with the album is to have a lot more of the kind of synth in there and some of my some of my other kind of metalhead friends uh they really love that too all the kind of synth effects so uh, i would like to to have a bit more of that uh throughout the album instead of just kind of you know intros and outros to songs i would love to incorporate them uh through you know completely throughout the songs as well <laughs> yeah so you know you have some analog equipment like like the little cog you showed us and then you also use digital tools so let's go gear versus digital well um my recording setup is pretty simple um like i said this is the first time i had recorded so i i didn't really know what i was doing i used the gear um that i had which was a PV 6505 mini head um, that uh, goes into a two by 12 or yeah, two by 12 cabinet with some vintage thirties. And I have uh, two microphones and a little mixer that I use to kind of blend those together. And that's kind of all the analog uh, stuff, very simple. And then it goes into uh, a line six rack uh, effects processor digital thing so in there i use um basically the other effects that my guitar amp doesn't have so the delay the chorus um uh maybe some flanger other things like that there's a like an over overdrive on there that's like a tube screamer um uh yeah so those are most of the kind of digital effects that i used from there and then in the software with that i use to record reaper is a doll uh there's some effects in there that i used if i had a million pedals then i probably would have used those but i didn't want to i'm just running out of room to put stuff you know and so um i just used the ones that i had and that i really liked the sound of and so you know all the guitars uh bass are just you know raw guitar tracks. I didn't do any DI stuff. I, I don't know how to DI stuff. It seemed like I'd have to buy something else and plug something in and learn another thing. And at that point, I was just like, you know, whatever sound is going to come out of here is going to be what people get. You know, we can EQ it a bit in, uh, you know, when I send it to Nico Mix to do his job. But yeah, it's pretty much just all raw guitar sound with a couple of this digital effects to it and that's kind of uh what i ended up using and so in the future i may get a maybe a different microphone or maybe a different speaker but i think that the main uh pieces are there to you know to make an album and stuff so um you know you can kind of tweak things however you want to sound um but i'm not a big fan of like uh going strictly digital and using impulse responses and having any guitar sound that you want because when i get into stuff like that i try every option and then five hours later i haven't recorded anything and i've made no progress and then i can't decide what i want so here it kind of limits me to uh a sound and then i'll just tweak it a bit to get where i want and just go on with my life 
you know? And I think that's kind of a, a big thing that I see in a lot of modern metal is just getting the perfect tone, the perfect sound. You know, I watch a lot of, you know, YouTube gear videos and stuff and everybody's just tweaking and just doing all these modifications and stuff. And at the end of the day, you know, it's metal, you know, and it should sound a bit raw. It should be a bit kind of grimy and a bit, uh, it shouldn't sound, you know, overly produced and um, just plastic. And so that's kind of why I love having, you know, a real amp with speakers because it keeps me away from second guessing myself and trying every other option under the sun, but having, you know, a convenient way to get the effects in there. Uh, and, you know, with it being, you know, that kind of mix of like uh, death metal, black metal, you know, it shouldn't be sounding Christine anyway. So it's, you know, to me, good enough, get it done and, you know, just be happy with it. And i um, floored with the way that it, it sounded when we were able to put it out the way it was mixed and mastered. You know, I think it sounds great. It was literally capturing the sound uh, I had in my head. And I can't believe that, you know, we, we did that. So. Yeah. You know, I, I'm definitely really starting to hate modern metal production. And, uh, you know, a lot of times there's just too many mids overall, you know, your album still has that kind of base for what it really needs to, you know, especially when you have the kind of palm muted parts, it really, they really pop out. Yeah. Yeah. And, and yeah, the modern metal production, you know, I, I watch those videos too on like how to record and all this stuff. And then they get into, you know, the EQ and compression and all these other types of things. And I'm just like, you know, that's great. But now it sounds like every other band that's out there. And uh, I was like, we're just going to record it kind of raw. And, you know, I told Nico Mix, just make it sound, you know, a bit gritty, a bit grimy and, uh, you know, have fun with it. And he didn't really change a whole lot with it. Um, Cause I'm pretty sure he's used, he's used to working with professional musicians who know what they're doing and send DI tracks and all of the other things. And I was just like, Nope, this is all we got. We're just going to go with it and uh, just make it sound cool. And he'd worked his magic and, and we got an album. Yeah. Oh, yeah, definitely. I mean, <laughs> you did much better than what those, those YouTube guys do because you know, when I see the state of those EQs, the compressors, I'm like, what the hell are you supposed to be doing? What the hell is this sound? You know, everything, nothing sounds cool anymore, you know, unfortunately with these guys. Yeah, and I, I left all that up to uh, Nico Mix to do. I was just like, here is my stuff. I kind of like the way it sounds. Just make it fit and kind of balance and hang in the mix. Um, so the only things I really did is I panned, you know, all the instruments to the sides, you know, the vocals as well, to where I wanted them to kind of sit orally. And... Um, I worked on, you know, making sure the volumes were at about the right levels that I kind of wanted for everything in the song. And then I would have him, you know, do whatever he did. And then I would evaluate and just say, yeah, let's turn up the bass a little bit on this or make the, um, you know, the, the bass drum less clicky or something like that. And, uh, you know, that's pretty much it. I just want to keep it kind of simple, straightforward and have a very full sounding mix without it sounding like every, you know, metal band, uh, every metal album that's come out in the past like 10 years, because they all sound fantastic and great, but it's kind of very hard to tell them apart because they all sound fantastic and great. And there's no kind of like that, you know, kind of essence of, of the rawness in metal that, you know, I absolutely love. And I think uh, is missing in a lot of stuff. Everything is very clean and polished, uh, but you know, that's, you know, growing up, that's not what metal was. It was a bit dirty. And uh, that's one of my favorite parts about, you know, the album is it it has a bit of that kind of dirty quality to it. Yeah. So, um, you know, let's move on to the lyrics. So, you know, obviously, I think you're probably the first band to kind of be like very, we love Star, this is Star Trek. We love it. Um, we're going to take all our lyrics from there. Right. Well, there are um, several other projects that have used Star Trek in the past. And I looked at those kind of before I went too far because um, when I started writing the music, I had no idea what the lyrics would be and where I would go with it. And um, I wasn't cult enough to write black metal 
you know, blasphemy and I wasn't into guts and gore to do, you know, the traditional kind of death metal stuff. And I needed something. And I was always a huge fan of Star Trek. So that's kind of where I went with it. But uh, in contrast to some of the other projects that I've seen, a lot of those were focused on um, kind of retelling the stories of the the starships and their captains and the characters or you know there's even like Klingon bands that just sing uh, about Klingon stuff I didn't really want to do that um, because I found when I watch it and when I'm in fully engaged in the show there's so many interesting unique and kind of terrifying things uh, that they encounter uh, such as different aliens or if they're ancient galactic races that they come across that are so interesting and unique that I really wanted to kind of tell those stories or flesh them out a bit more uh, and make them sound like a lot of, I think a lot of people don't know that they're probably listening to, you know, Star Trek inspired lyrics uh, because, you know, Captain Kirk, Captain Picard has never mentioned, the Enterprise has never mentioned. Uh, I wanted to keep it, uh, you know, kind of focused on a lot of the elements that are uh, kind of near and dear to Star Trek. So uh, uh, quite a few of the songs, you know, talk about uh, telepathy, mind control, and those are all similar kind of tropes that got have gotten used, you know, in episodes in all of the series over, you know, the past uh, several decades. And so I always found that as something really interesting and um, unique at the same time being, you know, quite terrifying. So I think that element was what I really wanted to, or direction that I wanted to go with the lyrical content is to make people um, kind of look at those aspects a little bit more and uh, think about that instead of just seeing, you know, the show as like the, the cast of characters on a starship doing that. Cause that's fantastic and I love it, but all those other kind of weird, creepy aliens, you know, kind of really got to me and I wanted to, to, to tell their story a bit. Yeah, definitely. I mean, you know, uh, I remember watching a bit of Star Trek as a kid, you know, later on, that kind of stuff was pushed to the side and all became about interpersonal, very kind of lighthearted stuff. Uh, all unfortunately lost its way over the years, but, it, you know, it's great to see that you're really going into the mythos and not the characters uh, themselves. Yeah, I mean, the characters, you know, they kind of, you know, have their place and stuff, and they just didn't really seem like good uh, lyrical content. I mean, because all I could kind of do was just retell the stories of an episode, and I think that would probably get kind of boring for people, or at least for me. So I wanted to do something else, something uh, a bit more unique, and so I tried to uh, watch the episodes and uh find some that always made me a little uh creeped out by certain things or uh made me uh just a bit more interested in stuff and so i would use some of the um kind of online resources to do a bit more uh kind of research about you know where certain maybe aliens came from like what planet they were on what that planet looked like to just get a bit more lyrical content to kind of you know flesh out that uh the stories and those ideas a bit um but the one thing i guess i, I like most about star trek in most any of its like kind of classic iterations and the movies as well is that it is uh, not a very dystopic uh vision of the future like almost every other kind of sci-fi movie or a uh, show that's been done before. So in Star Trek, you know, we have a bit of hope. We have a bit of uh, a, a glimpse into the potential of humanity and what they can do when we grow up and get past, you know, our certain uh, differences. And I just found that so compelling and uh, it made me want to watch more and maybe learn and kind of rethink and uh, evaluate um, certain things and so I found that as a great source of inspiration because it kept me hooked into the show uh, and if you look closely um, a lot of the shows particularly the older ones usually have some type of moral 
uh, or philosophical question that the characters um, work their way through. And I find that that to be kind of the crux of a lot of the show. And, and even when I was in college, I took some philosophy classes and they would bring up clips of Star Trek, uh, you know, and that really stuck with me. And so when I, when I finally got around to starting to watch it, I was like, oh, wow, this is really unique. It's something that I couldn't get from a lot of other TV shows. And so I just went for it and uh, I didn't want it to be cheesy. I didn't want people to instantly recognize this is, oh, you know, a Star Trek thing. Cause I'm pretty sure that would have like turned off a lot of people from it just being something that was derivative and uh, you know, just working that angle. So I kind of let people get inside it and then you know, walk around a bit. And then if they, you know, discover and figure out, oh, wow, this is comes from these episodes, then maybe they'll uh, still be interested and maybe they'll check out a bit of uh, some old Trek and learn to enjoy it and appreciate it as much as I do. Yeah. So are you genuinely interested in science fiction or is like Star Trek the kind of main thing that you're into because of all those qualities? Um, that's a great question. I do like a lot of science fiction stuff because I like the potential that it brings. Uh, you know, a lot of, you know, movies, uh, you know, are either, you know, dr very dramatic or their plot has been, you know, kind of done to death or they're full of, you know, superheroes with all these whatever powers and stuff, or they're based on historical things that have been done. And, you know, that's great for what they are, but science fiction just offers a whole new level of possibilities. And I always just found that to be so compelling because it just pushed me to like, think a little bit further than, you know, what we kind of normally uh, interpret life you know, to be or what our future can possibly be. So I think Star Trek is probably the main one that I grab onto. Uh, I've also got into the last couple of years, uh, I got into watching uh, Stargate SG-1, which I thought was a, a really cool show. Um, I'm not much of a movie person, so I don't watch too many movies, but I'm a sucker for just watching uh, old sci-fi stuff from the 60s and 70s. Uh, I love that it's, you know, they were actually building sets and mini models of starships and using that uh, as opposed to just having everything, you know, perfectly in HD and in, uh, you know, the CGI, whatever it is, how they create things. So even um, the first Dune movie that came out in, I believe, 1982 was something that I really you know, thought was pretty awesome and amazing. Uh, so my sci-fi, I, I don't dwell into every niche of it, but uh, those are kind of the main ones that I kind of like to, to watch. And then I'm also a nerd and I'll watch a lot of document documentaries and stuff on space and, you know, the planets in the universe and things like that. And uh, I've, that's always been a, an interest for me is, you know, what is out in the stars oh yeah i definitely agree with you uh you know because you know sometimes like when you watch these space documentaries the stuff they come up with is even more bizarre than anything you can imagine you know between black holes wormholes uh time dilation whatever you want you know yeah and you know for for making music you know those are wonderful avenues to pursue and uh, you know, the way that Trek approaches a lot of those things, you know, it's uh, kind of very unique uh, in that. And like I said, it's not such a dystopic thing where it's, you know, you know uh, such a, a future is so bleak all of the time that there, you know, it's a bit of hope for humanity to encounter these things and, you know, work to overcome stuff. And I always find that to be, uh, you know, after living in the, the real world reality, it's nice and refreshing at times to kind of have that, to be honest. Murray, I think, I think we went through everything pretty much. Any final words? Uh, well, number one, I'm grateful to you and to all of the fans out there who have supported not only the album, but uh, Spirit Coffin Publishing, 
uh, all the people who have uh, kind of lent their support um, to me, the hard work that uh, both Thomas and uh, David have done on the album has been amazing. I'd like to thank all of the other uh, channels and reviewers who took time out of their uh, busy schedule to listen to the album, probably repeatedly, and uh, share their thoughts, you know, and I always uh, appreciate criticism and I, you know, want to make better music and I want to make music that people enjoy. So I'm a very grateful and humble person when it comes to that. Um, so those are the main things uh, that I would like to say to everyone there, as well as all my friends and uh, the people who, you know, I shared the music with over, you know, the past uh, couple of years to get the album off, you know, that gave me feedback and stuff. So uh, it's great to have that support and friendship. And uh, I couldn't have made it this far without all of all of you. So thank you. All right. Thanks. So you, um, available on Spirit Coffin Publishing. Um, any European distros carrying it, carrying it? Unfortunately, not at the moment. Uh, the shipping is insane. <laughs> yeah. Um, when I shipped a the few albums to uh, Mr. Pennington in the UK, two vinyl and two CD was like almost forty five US dollars. <laughs> uh, yeah, it was pretty insane, and shipping the shipping about 15 albums to Thomas in France was nearly a hundred bucks. So that's kind of what's keeping it down. So uh, if we do get more people, you know, interested in the album, um, and if it ever gets a, a reprint or a reissue, maybe someone in Europe would, would pick it up and, and do that, I don't know. Definitely have to talk to, to Josh about that, but uh, I know there's a lot of European folks that would love to get it and people around the world. Um, but yeah, shipping is insane, like everywhere right now, because there's so many albums that I want to pick up that are in Europe that uh, I hesitate because that the shipping is almost as much as the album. And <laughs> yeah, literally. Yeah. So I'm hoping uh, that we do get um, to... Um, have some distribution, you know, to Europe. Uh, that would be fantastic because there's like a huge part, I think, of uh, people who listened to the album and checked it out are in Europe. So thank you guys. I really appreciate that. All right. Well, have a nice evening. Thank you very much. Hey, Nick, it's been a pleasure to be here. Appreciate all of your support. Uh, anytime you want to chat, man, hit me up. All right. Will do. Thanks very much. You're welcome. Bye. Bye.